I'm James Craig, your host on The Big Ones. And we're going to Montana, the land of the big sky and big game, on an elk hunt near the historical Bighorn River. With the exception of the moose, the elk is the largest of the deer family. And the elk, or wapiti, as the Shawnee Indians named it, is one of the most coveted trophies in North America. In just one minute, we'll join world-famous sportsman Herb Klein on a winter trophy hunt going after elk below zero. in more than 20 states, but Montana has one of the largest herds. Now this gives the average hunter, the deer hunter, a chance to include an animal on his list which is really big game. On this trip to the big sky country, we'll be going along with an above average hunter, Herb Klein. This trip started here in Herb's Den in Dallas, Texas. The walls are nearly covered with more than 150 of what Herb calls his more interesting trophies, collected during 40 years of big game hunting. And like most of his trophy hunts, this one was started by the postman with a letter. When you've gone hunting as many years as I have, you get letters. You get lots of letters. You get letters from people asking advice, from the guy who's supposed to know everything. People want to know where to hunt jackrabbits. They want to know where to hunt elephants, or maybe elk. You also get letters from guides and outfitters. They've always got that big one hidden out for you, and naturally I'm a sucker for the big one. This last fall, I found out that the Montana Commission was going to extend the elk season in southern Montana into the winter. I also had a letter from one of the outfitters in southern Montana telling me that he had two or three big elk, probably bigger than this one, hidden out, and he wanted me to come up and make a try for one. Naturally, I was all for it. I wanted to try out my 300 Magnum, the new one, my blonde bomber. And I also wanted to try out some of the new 165 grain bullets. Let me just show you. These are all foreigners. I collected all those on several trips to Africa and to Asia. The elk hunter really has quite a variety of calibers and bullet weights to choose from. A lot of elk hunters prefer a big gun, like a 375 or a 378 Weatherby. Actually, those cannons aren't necessary for elk. I use them on Cape Buffalo in Africa or water buffalo in India or something like that. Other hunters prefer a 270, a 7 millimeter, and now maybe the new 270 uh, Magnums and the 7 millimeter Magnums. Actually, they're quite all right, but the only reason most hunters use them is because they have less recoil. I'm not particularly allergic to recoil, so that doesn't bother me. I like to hunt elk with a 300 Magnum. And with this little number, I get about 3,400 feet a second with a 165 grain bullet and lots of uh, foot-pounds of energy. So that's plenty for an elk. Now, an elk is quite a big animal and takes a lot of killing. A big bull will weigh, oh, maybe a 1,000 pounds. And during the mating season, when they're full of adrenaline and don't get any sleep and keep on the go all the time, they're quite hard to kill. I was also ready to make a 250, 300, or maybe a 400 yard shot if necessary. So this is the little baby that was going to do the job for me on this trip. The Bighorn River Canyon, sliced through solid rock by the raging waters of Montana's legendary river. Northeast, on the Little Bighorn is the place where General Custer made his last mistake and his last stand. And today, 
the Indians are still here. At this point, the Bighorn River is the boundary of the Crow Indian Reservation, covering thousands of square miles to the east and to the north. This Indian territory, closed to outside hunters, is like a huge game preserve. But there is great hunting around the edges because animals can't tell when they've crossed the line on a map. Herb flew a commercial jet to Billings, drove down to Bridger, where he joined his outfitter, Buck Sanford, and then went farther south, where they started their helicopter trip down the Bighorn. The plan was to take the easy way into Buck Sanford's winter headquarters, and then pack in to the hunting camp. Herb has made over a hundred trips into the wilderness areas of North America. He started hunting big game back in 1925 when he was working in the oil fields of Wyoming. On this trip, traveling over the rough spot, he was heading toward one of the most beautiful pieces of real estate on earth. In winter, this is a kind of scenery you can enjoy only at a distance. Up on the tops of those mountains, in the high lonesome, the temperature may drop to 50 below. And the winds sweeping down from Canada could knock a helicopter right out of the sky. No living thing can survive very long in those winds. It's no wonder the Assiniboine Indians call this weather a hard time move. But for hunters, it means that the wild game will be moving down farther and faster from the heights, down where they can see them at least, if they're lucky. This is big game country. And the cold weather is just one part of their struggle for survival. This is something we forget sometimes when we live in cities, sheltered and insulated, with life and death carefully hidden away in hospitals. Up here, life begins and ends under the big sky, out in the open. And nature marks time by the changing seasons. Right now, nature has provided these elk with thick winter coats, adequate protection against the cold. But another element of nature, the heavy snows, has covered their grazing lands. So they've started drifting out of the high country crossing the foothills toward the valleys beyond on their never-ending search for food. They feed on leaves, bark and twigs of alders, willow, maple, quake and aspen. And when the snow is not too deep, they dig through for grass and moss. Each snowstorm drives them farther down the mountains. During this migration, they can never relax their watch for predators. Just one more part their struggle for survival. For this kind of trouble, nature has given the bull elk a good sense of sight, smell, and hearing. And a couple of good weapons, his rack and his razor-sharp hooves. The bighorn sheep start moving down from their summer home on the peaks at the first snow. Food is always more scarce for them. Their main protection against predators is keen eyesight and they can run from danger where no man, not even a deer, can follow. The mule deer's main protection are their scoop-like ears. They can hear sounds no human ear could capture. The cougar, or mountain lion, is one of the predators. He stalks deer and elk better than any hunter sneaking in close and making his kill in a few violent seconds. The wolves take longer. Unlike the cougar, they hunt in packs, shadowing the elk and deer herds down through the timber. Usually, they try to cut out a stray and then run it down, closing in only when the animal is too tired to defend itself. But even these symbols of eternal hunger have their place in nature's pattern. Everything fits together like the pieces of a beautiful jigsaw puzzle. And a hunter, like Herb Klein, 
is just one small part of it. He's no threat to the balance of nature because he takes only one animal out of thousands. And the one he takes has lived out its useful life and is usually too old to reproduce its kind. Right now, Herb had gone as far as it was safe to travel by helicopter and then packed them to the hunting camp. This would be home for an unknown number of days. Protected from the high winds by the walls of a Rimrock Canyon. George takes a gun, a full-blooded Crow Indian. Buck's assistant guide, Tom Edwards, part Crow, a licensed guide and rancher from Bridger. And the team, in turn, was introduced to Herb's blonde bomber, his 300 Magnum. It had been brought from Dallas in an all-weather case, padded to prevent the sights from getting knocked out of line. From here on, it will be carried in Herb's hands, on his back, or in his saddle scabbard. George takes a gun as a licensed game warden, and it would be part of his job to make sure that the white men didn't wander into Indian territory after game. Now it was late, and it was cold, just a little below zero. And with the introductions over, the first thing to do was to get a good night's sleep. The hunt would begin at dawn. This was the beginning of the first day out. It was going to be a cold ride up the canyon with some rough climbing afterwards. And both Herb and Buck hoped the weather would hold. There were snow flurries. The thermometer was still above zero. And up on the rim, the sun was shining. Just two hours out of camp, Buck spotted a quick flicker of movement up on the rim. It looked like a small herd with two bulls following behind. So they decided to split up and take a closer look. This kind of terrain, even a good horse can only go so far. Then you get off and walk, and climb. The main idea is to reach a vantage point above the animals. And this is especially tough when they're up on the high ground. Even if your horse could make the climb, you'd walk to avoid skylining yourself on the rim. At the top, Herb and Tom Edwards decided to wait. Buck had circled to their left, and if there was a herd of elk in the timber, Buck would spook them into the clear. Two bulls. Most hunters would be satisfied with either one. But Herb passed them up, not quite big enough. There was plenty of time and plenty of game. During the next few days, the hunters saw more elk than most hunters see in a lifetime. Large herds of cows. Each herd gathered up during the fall mating season bossed by an old bull elk. The loners. Bulls too young or too old. 
to gather herds of their own. The big bull is the sultan of this animal kingdom. Around September, he begins to battle other bulls to build up a large harem of females. And then when the mating season is over, around November, he gradually loses interest in his herd. And by March, when he sheds his antlers, he joins up with the other bulls, and they live together peacefully apart from the cows. In June, the calves are born. And the fighting between the bulls starts all over again the next fall. The mating season is just about over now, but the bulls are still with their cows, searching for food. There were lots of elk. To find the biggest bull with the best rack took a lot of riding, a lot of walking, and a lot of time. And when Herb finally saw his trophy, after 13 days of searching, it was just pure luck. Up in the timber, miles away, a pack of wolves made their move. the elk on the plateau above him, but he saw several cows running along the rim rock ledge. And then he saw the big bull elk, the one he'd been looking for. For the first time in 14 days of hunting, Herb slipped off to safety. of nature. A bull elk, trophy class. His days had been numbered and now they were over. His herd of cows had gone on their way, unharmed. And in the spring, they would give birth to their calves. And during the next mating season, younger, stronger bulls would fight over them. Buck had been right. His letter to Herb had paid off for both of them. This big old bull was really a great trophy. And there's not a trophy hunter alive who can resist measuring a rack just to see how good it is. Measurements of different parts of the rack would be used later, after the required drying out period. To arrive at a total number of points, according to a formula worked out for each North American big game animal by the Boone and Crockett Club, 
The club sets a minimum number of points for each species. And to qualify, each trophy must exceed these minimums. This big bull would be near the top in the pages devoted to elk in the next edition of the Boone and Crockett record book. This is what Herb had come for. Back at camp, George takes a gun and heard the shot. He figured that Herb had got something. So he started to round up the burrow, just in case there was a heavy wreck to bring in. He finally got him with a cigarette. Next step would be caping out the trophy for the taxidermist and quartering the animal. This would take about an hour. And then some lucky Indian family would have enough meat for the winter. This hunt had been a good one. Now that it was over, the weather dropped below zero again. Nobody cared. They were going home. If you're not a hunter, I hope we've shown you that a man with a gun, especially a trophy hunter like Herb Klein, can be a part of the natural pattern of life and death in the wilderness. If you are a hunter and you're planning an elk hunt, I've got one piece of advice. Start earlier in the season. Otherwise, you'd better bundle up good for that sub-zero weather. And we'll be back to take you hunting and fishing again in distant lands, warmer climates, wherever we can find the big ones. <laughs>